So I w- thank you very much, Ibrat, and, and your team, and also the Responsible Research Network to, uh, to organize this. And thanks, everyone, for, for coming along. It's, it's, uh, it's really great to see so many people here in the, uh, the Zoom call, but also on YouTube and, and from many different parts of the world. So that, that's really, really great to see. It's also really great to see this interest in, uh, in theory. Uh, so I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I've got some things that I want to get through together. Um, so I'm going to talk for about 35 minutes, as Ibrat said. We'll have a Q&A at the end. And I really like to hear uh, from you also um, sort of maybe things that you would like to connect to uh, based on the talk. But feel free to also beyond the talk, ask me anything you want to ask. Uh, in, in relation to, uh, to theory and, and even as, as specific as the types of papers that you're working on at this point in time. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, wait, okay. Yeah, yeah, next slide, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about theory in a minute and, and different ways of thinking about theory also in the context of your own papers. And um, I suppose my perspective is really guided by having been an editor for, for quite a considerable amount of time. So previously with the Journal of Management Studies and afterwards with the Academy of Management Review and now with Organization Theory. And, and one of the things that I I personally care about is to, to really demystify this topic of theorizing different aspects to do with your theory, to think about your, your theoretical perspective or the construct you're working with, but also words like a theoretical contribution to really make it as, as crystal clear to, to um, because it's heavily codified language to make it as crystal clear to authors what we mean by these things. So I'm also going to do that in my talk in a minute so that I hope there's going to be some really clear, practical, easily understood takeaways for you to, uh, to take away from this session. But before I start, let me say a few things why I think particularly now we really need good, good theorizing. And um, you might say, well, theory has always been important uh, to the social sciences and to the work that we do in management and organization studies as the tools that we use to, to ask questions, to make deep interpretations of phenomena, to arrive at explanations. That, that's true, that has always been the case. But I think particularly now there's some really interesting and important, probably quite fundamental changes and developments in society that, uh, that will be affecting quite a lot of people. Um, so think of the gig economy. I've got a picture there of a, of a deliver, Deliveroo uh, driver um, and how that is shaking up the, the nature of the employment relationship. So effectively suggesting that beyond being an independent contractor or an employee, there is a, a third type of employment that exists in our economy and that, uh, that there are organizations that employ such people as well. Uh, think of all the sustainable development goals and, and the questions that have been asked around companies and the degree to which they address these issues, the, um, the degree to which they uh, focus on what is called ESG, environmental, social and governance uh, related responsibilities and commitments. Think about the digital digitalization of work. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, affecting a lot of, uh, actually also affecting us now being able to connect in this particular way, but affecting quite fundamentally over the next couple of years, work, employment, uh, the organizations that people work for. Um, and think about questions about purpose. So there's been a lot of debate around recently about, again, about the theory of the corporation or the theory of the organization and what types of ideals or purposes uh, organizations should be, uh, should be anchored on. Just a few examples, but I think I'm trying to make the point that we're living in a time where there's a lot of dynamism, a lot of change. Some really fundamental changes will be uh, with us over the next five to 10 years. And for all of these topics, we obviously need to gather empirical evidence, but we also need good theorizing to make sense of that and to, uh, to get to these deeper answers and better explanations that, uh, than, than what we currently have. Um, yes, next slide, please, Sophia, yeah. Um, so 
what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about what theory is, and then I, I, I thought I would make it very practical uh, and just give you a bit of a, a roadmap or a process for thinking about the steps that you could take around the theoretical aspects of, of your own paper. Um, and if, if the, the detail on the slide can come up, then I can speak to that. Um, so that's the first thing. I'll talk about what theory is, then I'll I'll get you going in thinking about some points to think about when you start to write theory. So I'll say a little bit based on my editorial experience, what I, I see that editors and reviewers think is important in, the, in, in relation to theory. And then, as I said, I'm going to take you through a bit of a roadmap, a very, a hopefully a very practical set of steps for thinking about the, the theory development in your paper. Um, so the first step is, is really just um, a conceptual, almost like a thought experimentation exercise, you know, thinking about the topics that you're exploring and the, the ideas, the ways in which you're conceptualizing about those topics, the ideas that you're developing, first of all. So this is before you actually start to write. Uh, so we'll talk, I'll talk you through that step. And then the subsequent steps are really, once you've figured out what some potentially useful ideas might be to address a topic, are about how can you uh, frame that and position that in terms of your writing that it seemed to make a, a really good contribution. Uh, so that's the grounding step that I'll get to. And then finally, we're going to talk about uh, particular ways of writing. Uh, so think of... Um, um, you know, forming propositions or think of process theorizing different styles of reasoning uh, that you might use in, in the body of your paper. And then we'll also talk a little bit about the, uh, the different sections of a paper, the formatting of the text and your, uh, your writing itself, the tone and clarity of your expression. Um, and the first part of my talk will be about theory in general, but then towards the end, um, I'm also going to talk a little bit specifically about theory papers, so conceptual papers and what the different styles that are common in that particular uh, context. And, and again, in the hope that that will help you demystify what a conceptual piece is, what it may look like and what the different varieties are that exist. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of, uh, of three very common types. And then we'll move to the Q&A. Uh, and as I said, I'm, I'm I'm going to give you uh, my, my take, but I'm also very interested in, in hearing uh, from you any questions that you have around theory. So let me start with this question of theory, which is actually a pretty, uh, pretty tough question. Um, and Merton, many years ago, uh, this quote has been used time and time again, where the sociologist Merton said, you think about the word theory, it means so many different things to so many different people. And he was, and he's not the only one, but he was effectively saying, shouldn't we just get rid of the word altogether? Couldn't we just find more accurate, simpler language that better describes what it is that academic social scientists do uh, when they attend to conceptual matters, when they try to conceptualize the world around them? Um, so he said it ranges from everything from minor working hypothesis to uh, theoretical speculation, so really deep thought experimentation to more axiomatic systems of thought. So more formal modeling or formal reasoning on the back of axioms, highly stylized sets of assumptions. And he saw that theory is understood in these different ways within sociology, but obviously beyond sociology, within the social sciences, equally you have these very wide ranging definitions of what theory is. And rather than throw out the word is actually quite useful to, um, to um, think, to, to realize that theory does have those different, uh, Sophia, we're seeing the other part of your screen now. So, sorry, yeah. It's useful to, uh, to, to think about these, these different notions of theory as, as actually alternative understandings. And in order to get to those different understandings of what theory is and what it means and what therefore also a theoretical contribution is, we need to go back in time to, uh, to uh, uh, the, the roots of the word theory, uh, which come from the word, which come from the Greek theoria, which was the idea that as a person, you could leave your city state and travel the world, so to speak, go to a festival, uh, go to an athletic competition, go somewhere, 
and 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 have that experience and then when you would come back after that journey or after that pilgrimage uh, you would come back a changed person because you've seen the world and how it's different beyond the borders of of, of your city state and having come back with that formative experience as a resource you can now look at your city state in a different light you can ask different questions you can understand it much more deeply than you you could previously um, a modern scientific understanding has used this uh, original meaning of the word theory to suggest that the person coming back so to speak to his city state would equipped with that knowledge of the world outside be better able to uh, explain the workings of the city state would be really better able to to get at the deeper lying structures and processes that determine the operations of the city state how it's governed how people relate to each other whatever it is that you're interested in so modern scientific understanding said theory or the, the the way in which we should understand this notion of theoria as a journey uh, is really about explanation so getting digging down into those underlying structures and processes nowadays we we talk about that in terms of mechanisms that underlie a particular topic or phenomenon but that 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 was the the key idea uh, but then uh gadamer who's a um who you know probably from hermeneutics said that that's only one way of thinking about the theoria um, metaphor the theoria idea um actually what happens when the person comes back is that he becomes much more reflective of having gained that experience from of, of the knowledge community in that city state that he's a member of. And it allows him or her to think about how things are generally understood in the city state and also reflect on how things could be understood more deeply or differently compared to how that has been happening previously. Uh, so Gadamer really gave it an interpretive twist. And he said, theory is really about these deeper readings, these deeper interpretations uh, in this case, that you give of a, of, a, of a city state based on the experiences that you've gained elsewhere. And then finally, uh, Habermas, uh, uh, the philosopher, in his inaugural lecture that is reprinted in, uh, in one of his books in 1972, he said that no, the theoria metaphor is actually the idea, if you go back to Plato and Aristotle, that theory is about speculation, and theory is about thinking how things could be otherwise. So the person coming back to the city state would equip with that knowledge, be able to not just reflect and have those deeper readings, but also think and question and criticize how things could be, could be different. Um, all to say that if you go back to the roots of the word theory, and this is quite instructive, is that the notion of theory could be either explanation uh, or geared towards explanation. A theory could also be geared towards providing a deeper interpretation. And a theory could also be geared towards critique or emancipation. And that's, that's actually a very important point to bear, bear in mind. Fair enough, in, in social sciences, the explanatory interpretation of theory is one that, that is obviously quite dominant and privileged, but the other two are there. And the other two in the social sciences have always been there ever since the, uh, well, ever since, you know, if we go back to the roots of the word, uh, and how it was debated in, in, in ancient Greece. Uh, and they've always been there and maybe less, less prominent, but they're equally valid and valuable conceptions of what, what theory is. Next slide, please, Sophia. Um, so what is theory? Well, the, the first thing to bear in mind then is it, it's about creating understanding. So to keep that story in mind that I just told you, uh, it's about either providing a, an explanation, a deeper interpretation, or a critique towards an emancipatory aim. That's one. Secondly, um, it's, you know, in, 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 in explanation, interpretation, or emancipation, we do different things, we reason differently. Uh, but in all of these cases, theorizing involves an act of conceptualizing something in a particular way. Uh, so you're interested in a particular topic, and then you decide what conceptual language resources you can mobilize and can bring to bear on that particular topic. So to give you an example of my own work, I've looked a lot uh, in the past at, at, at uh, language being used by entrepreneurs or, or by managers um, 
or by others in the context of organizations. And in all of these cases, I always need to think about the topic that I'm looking at, what's the real problem that I'm looking at, and then think about what conceptual resources I bring to bear to qualify and conceptualize that topic in a particular way. So do I link to identity? Do I link to sense making? Do I link to discourse? Do I link to you know, whatever else there is? Uh, and the important point here to bear in mind is as you do that, as you make that leap to a conceptual resource, and, uh, and those may be given in an existing literature, but it may also be that I'm creatively bringing them, bringing a resource from maybe a, an adjacent field or another field to bear on the topic that I'm interested in. As you're doing that, you're also qualifying the topic as a theoretical subject in a particular way. So it allows me to, so if I see an instance of language through the lens of sense making, it allows me suddenly to conceptualize the, the topic, the phenomenon that I'm interested in, in a particular way, to qualify it in a particular way. I make certain assumptions. It allows me to ask certain questions. So this act of conceptualization is a very, very powerful uh, thing to, uh, to bear in mind. And I'll, I'll come back to that in, uh, in, in a minute or two. When we conceptualize something and do work on the back of that, so maybe I can elaborate my conceptualization into a set of hypotheses or propositions geared towards explanation. I'm doing that uh, intellectual activity in a way because I think that it helps me uh, get to the bottom of something, uh, allows me to, uh, allows me and others to think about something in a deeper, better or different way than we could otherwise do. Uh, and that's, that third point is actually quite important. So if you think about what it is that we do with theorizing is that we really want to, it's not just about empirics, it's using empirics to, to get to that deeper set of answers, that conceptualized set of un understanding of what the underlying patterns or trends are that really determine something or that explain why something comes about in a particular way. Um, and when we do that, that's of value to ourselves. Uh, in terms of knowledge generation, but it's also of value to our students, practitioners, journalists, others in society who will, who will benefit from that because they can also see how things hang together or how things could be better or differently understood than they previously did. And then finally, there are different styles of reasoning and writing that I'll, I'll come to in a minute and, and that in many ways also connected to those different aims of explanation, interpretation or emancipation. Yes, next slide, please, Sophia. Okay, um, so what to think about before you get started? And, and here are just uh, a couple of points, just from my own, it's my two cents from my own experience as, as an editor working for these different journals. Um, if you can put the, the next points up, Sophia, then um, these are some of the things to, to think about that come up time and time again. And I, I say them from the perspective of an editor, but when I'm an author, I'm equally struggling with these things and, and I'm, I'm guilty of, of, of them at the same time. Uh, but one of the things, the first thing to bear in mind is that, uh, you know, you, in order to write a compelling paper, you cannot bite off more than you can chew. So you cannot make the, the paper too broad and about too big a topic or too many topics at the same time to try and bring it down to human scale so that in the context of an article, uh, you can really address that, that topic uh, and the way in which you conceptualize it in a, in a detailed enough manner. And often bringing it back, narrowing your scope, bringing it back to a more manageable topic is, 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 is something that, that I really, uh, is, is really important. Uh, the second thing is obviously framing and reframing your work, uh, particularly if, when you're bringing your ideas into a conversation, into a, a literature that, that already exists around the topic in most cases. That framing and reframing and with that motivating the space for your theory development, that, that is such a crucial thing uh, to be thinking about. And, and one thing that you should constantly test your paper on, have I done that? sufficiently well in order to make that case for my theoretical argument. Then the third thing is also really important is this idea that we all theorize and write and reason in different ways. So when you write a theory paper based on propositions, that's different from process theorizing. 
when you do a qualitative inductive theory building paper, such papers in terms of the, the, way, the, the way in which you reason and build up uh, a paper like that looks very, is very different from a deductive hypothesis testing paper. And the thing to bear in mind there is that you really should be conscious of, of all of these different uh, styles, all, all of these different ways of theorizing and writing that are out there. So just to give you an example, I'm, I'm not a, a quantitative scholar, but my time at JMS taught me a lot about the uh, deductive hypothesis testing approach in terms of how reviewers felt that that's, you know, what the ideal model should be for papers like that. So that you, um, you really work in most cases from one conceptual resource or one conceptual frame or two. If, if it's two, you should really do the groundwork first to bring them together in, an, in a coherent manner. And then make sure that as you're building off that conceptualization of the resource that you're connecting to the topic, that you create a very coherent and well-integrated structure of hypothesis on the back of that. And I've seen that mentioned time and time again, that there's no integrated hypothesis structure. I've also seen mentioned time and time again that in terms of the development, so the argumentation that you do in support of each of the hypotheses, that that hypothesis development section is not really worked through sufficiently well. The reasoning isn't clear. There's reasoning by association, meaning that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm theorizing here about uh, forming hypothesis about entrepreneurial cognition, and I'm drawing in some ideas from psychology, and I'm reasoning that by association with psychology, we would more or less expect the same things in the entrepreneurial context. Uh, and that type of reasoning by association is not the strongest type of reasoning. So ideally for that form, reviewers, readers would like you to make, make use of, you, could, you can of course make use of those ideas, but then accommodate them in the context of entrepreneurial cognition and write out your arguments in ways that really apply to the entrepreneurial context. So these are just um, uh, some examples of how it's important and one way in which you can do this is to really try and deconstruct for yourself, based on the work that you're doing, papers that are out there in, in, in uh, good journals that follow a particular format so that you really grasp the, uh, the ins and outs of each of these styles in detail and can model yourself in your writing on them accordingly. And then the final point is also very important, is that when you write, uh, both this goes for both empirical and conceptual pieces, make sure that you're writing, realize that your writing is an act of reasoning. Um, and what I mean with that is that you really need to draw out your, your argumentation. You can't just posit or claim something and leave it at that. You really need to draw out your reasoning in support of your claims. So to give you an example of that, when I was at AMR and I, I had a lot of uh, process theorizing papers being submitted, I would get papers that would say, you know, here's a process model with, with stage A, B, C, and D, say of a, a process of institutional change or a process of institutionalization, but then didn't explain, didn't reason and take the reader through the argument in terms of how A was triggering B and how B might be connected to, uh, to C. So don't just posit or claim something, uh, but really draw out your reasoning in sufficient detail. Next, next slide, please, Sophia. Okay, um, so the first step in that, uh, that, that, that practical guide or that root map that I suggested is, is really think about, uh, I call it finding your way, think about the areas that you're exploring. Uh, so think about uh, the topics that you're interested in, and in relation to that, think about the, the conceptual resources, the literatures that exist, the concepts, the theoretical perspectives, the broader discourses that exist around that topic uh, that you could draw in. So first of all, a topic, and this is actually quite an important thing to, to, to realize, is that a topic could be a phenomenon that is out there, so to speak, in the you know, empirical reality, but a topic could also be a previously conceptualized theoretical topic. So, to, so an example of the first would be, you know, how are people interpreting uh, their changing work environment, maybe now because of, because of COVID? 
Um, and a, an example of the second would be, how can we understand conceptually processes of sense making? In both of these cases, what you would do is you would first of all, obviously think about these topics, but then also read the literature around it. Uh, and with that first question that I have, that, that phenomenon of how do people interpret their changing work environment, I could read many, many different things, obviously, in different literatures that speak to the question of these changing work environments. What are they? Are they to do with uh, certain aspects of technology affecting the work environment? Is it about the balance between being at home and being at work and how that has been changing because of an alternative arrangement uh, around work? Uh, I could also think about this, this point of interpret or people. Am I talking about workers, employees, managers, what is interpreting. Uh, I could look at that from the perspective of more organizational behavior, questions of commitment or uh, attitude, perhaps. I could also look at it from the perspective of sense making or things like job crafting and careers. So there's a lot of literature that I could potentially, as conceptual resources, connect to a question like that. And, and what is often the case that when you start reading, there's also a back and forth movement between the topic and the resources so that as I'm reading, I'm now realizing that my topic is pretty, my topic statement, my problem statement is pretty fake. So people is, is not sufficiently clarified. Uh, so I haven't really, in terms of what we said earlier, in terms of scoping and narrowing your focus, I haven't really done that properly. So that iteration between resources and topic already allows me to, uh, to do that. Uh, and as I'm reading these different resources, I think it's often helpful for yourself to just draw out uh, you know, what directly applies, what applies less. Also for yourself, decide what you find most interesting or less interesting, but then also do the groundwork. Think about what are the different vantage points in all of these different resources? What are some of the assumptions that they've been making? What are so some of the core concepts that have been used in each of these perspectives? Um, so that you draw that out and start to map out what potential resources are around the topic. And then finally, the last step would be, uh, next, next uh, bullet point, Sophia, please, uh, is that you decide for yourself, you know, once I've done this, these, this exploration, uh, what do I find an interesting conceptualization, an interesting set of resources that I connect to this topic, and one that I would like to pursue, and I say, I say, I phrase it here individually, because obviously you at the end have to decide, but it's also a choice that you make supported by people around you. So think of your supervisors, think of, of um, faculty mentors, think of, of you know, people that, that you could ask for a friendly review to test out some of these ideas that you're having. Uh, next slide, please. And the... Um, one way of, of, of thinking about this process is, uh, and I'm, I'm using, I'm making a reference here to uh, Carl Weick's work on theory construction as disciplined imagination. Um, and, and Carl used the, the, his model as basically a model for theorizing in general, but I think it's a particularly useful model. That's why I've got the armchair in the, uh, on the slide here to, without having to go into the field, so to speak, uh, to really think about this process of conceptualization first. Uh, and in, in disciplined imagination, you have those three steps and I'll give you, uh, I'll give you an example of how it works. Uh, also how it worked in, in the context of my own work where I've been through this cycle for myself and have figured out, or we, I should say, because it was a collective of us, had figured out a, an interesting conceptualization that we felt would have legs and could be, could be plausible and persuasive once we put it into words, once we put it on paper and write it up as a potential contribution. So Wyke says, start with that topic, the problem statement. Uh, so let's say the topic is, how have people thought about sense-making? And that's also a reference to Carl, obviously, because he's been a, a, a key figure in that literature. Then the thought trial is, is really thinking about, so I'm reading all of this sense-making work. So some people say, you know, sense making is really this retrospective rationalization of what has happened. Uh, others say it's not just retrospective, it's also prospective. 
others limit really sense making really to particular sets of circumstances like crisis or change where your expectations will be uh, will be challenged or will be broken and where you really actively need to recover a sense of sense and others say sense making is really a routine process of of interpreting your environment uh, on a continuous basis so what i'm seeing when i read all of these resources is that it's a really big very diverse, maybe also somewhat diffuse uh, field of sense making that has started to talk about sense making in, ma in many, many different ways. So, back to my topic how have people talked about sense making, conceptually uh, thought about sense making? They've done so in very, very different ways. Um, so, if, if you could press the button, Sophia, then I'll just press it all the way through. It, that, that's fine. Um, the first thing that Weick says is that you need to read widely and deeply. Uh, so here, together with my co-authors, we've been reading all of the work on sense making, but then we're also, in terms of our thought trials, we're also thinking about, you know, what are all these different definitions, all of these different takes on sense making? What do they signify? What do they mean? Can they be somehow be brought together? Uh, and that's uh, as part of the thought trials, the steps where I'm thinking through my conceptualization. Is there a way uh, in which we could bring all these different notions of sense making together as part of maybe a coherent formulation? And the two papers that I cited on the left there appeared at the same time and they're actually doing something very similar. So in both cases, they're using different conceptual resources, they offer a typology of sense making uh, and say that there's four different types of sense making. In the paper of Sandberg and Tsukas, they say, let's make a detour to the resource of phenomenology because that gives us a coherent, integrated formulation to capture four very distinct forms of sense making that have been conceptualized previously in the literature. Um, in my own case, with Henry Shield and Saku Mantra, we say, well, actually, sense making can be seen as acts of reasoning or acts of interpretation. So we draw on the reasoning literature to classify types of sense making from that perspective. Um, so what is interesting here is that we're both making these these through these iterations, these going through these thought trials, and finding yet another resource to conceptualize, reconceptualize how we could potentially uh, think about sense making. As we're thinking through the concepts and implications, in both cases, we're saying sense making is a useful concept, but uh, you know, there's a danger that it means different things to different people. So let's try and be a bit more nuanced and a bit more uh, careful and specific in specifying different types of sense making as part of our typology. Um, and then we select, and that's the third step that White suggests, you, you select one of these readings on the back of that exercise. Um, so it's just a very helpful cycle to be going through for yourself and to think about the conceptualization that you're coming up with, whether that has sufficient legs, is sufficiently plausible. Why has a couple of these criteria that might help you with that to assess whether, whether this is something that you could be working on. Um, next slide, please. The, uh, the next step is, is then to think about bringing it into a paper. So in our case, you know, we felt there's this something to be said for this idea, drawing on reasoning to conceptualize sense making in, in terms of four distinct types. And those are explained in the paper, so I'm not going to go through too, many, too much detail here. So we have a topic we want to explain, in this case, a, a theoretical subject of how have people explain sense making, how people conceptualize sense making. That's our aim. We want to theorize about that, give an alternative take on the concept of sense making and its various manifestations. When we want to write that up as a paper, the next step then is to really be joining a conversation. And Anne Hoff, I just, just push it all the way through, Sophia, then I'll, I'll speak to the, uh, the other parts of, this, of the slides. Uh, Anne Hoff says that as you write, it's really important that you, that you think about uh, your writing as joining a conversation. So in our case, that meant that Obviously, we need to show that we're conversant with a lot of the sense-making work that, that exists, where people have started to review the body of literature and, and said that, you know, it's been very successful, it's been expanding, it's been 
looking at sense making in all of these different contexts, but it has also been sprawling at the same time. It's become a very broad umbrella construct that uh, that also has been starting to hide differences between different types of sense making. So connecting to that literature uh, and showing that you uh, you know it is is obviously an important part of of your job. And that also means in Locke and Goldenbiddle terms that you really try and draw also rhetorically through your textual, uh, uh, through the text that you're writing, those linkages with prior work. So I might just sketch the development of the sense-making literature up until this point in time. So that success, but also the fact that it's become expanded into lots and lots of different areas and that the concept as itself, itself has become a bit vague. Um, by making those connections, I can then start to develop the ground and the context for the contribution that we're developing. Next slide, please. And these steps of, of, of joining a conversation and framing are, are actually really, really crucial. And if you haven't come across the Lock and Golden Biddle paper, I'm, I'm sure you have. Um, but if you haven't, I, I would really encourage you to have a look at it. They have a very neat way of, of thinking about the question of framing and positioning. And framing, it's another one of these, these um, codified words. All that it means is that you give a synthesis, you, you, you sketch the common ground around the topic, um, you say what the limitations are, so you, you show a complication around that common ground. That, that's all there is to framing. So it's offering a good synopsis of the literature uh, and with that synopsis, also hinting at the, uh, the limitations, the downsides, the deficiencies, the problematic aspects that exist in that literature. So in our case, sense making has done really well, but it also has a, a key limitation that the core concept has, has become quite vague. And that we're sometimes comparing apples and pears because sense making in a strategy context or an entrepreneurial context may be very different from uh, a crisis scenario, for instance. Um, so that's framing and then positioning is really about what it is that you bring theoretically in terms of your vantage point. So in our case, that was offering this new perspective from a reasoning perspective uh, and offering a more uh, coherent typology that would bring these different types of sense making uh, together. Um, and Locke and Goldenbiddle say in terms of this framing and positioning, there's three things that you could do. Either you say, uh, based on your framing of the existing literature, it's, it's fine how theoretically it's been developing, but it's incomplete. And you position yourself as, as offering that elaboration or that complication. So you're taking something a little bit further uh, in, in some ways, maybe new context that you're looking at, maybe a new additional concept that you uh, put into the mix, something that you add and that you position yourself as, as, as doing. Then the inadequacy option is this idea that um, existing lit you, you, you frame the existing literature in terms of how it's been developing, but you also problematize it, you complicate it as being in and of itself inadequate to fully capture the, uh, the topic. And you position yourself as either giving an alternative take, an alternative conceptualization, or a conceptualization, as in the case of that sense-making study, that blends or integrates, incorporates previously separate perspectives and brings that together. And then finally, incommensurability is this uh, is, is even more high level, uh, so sort of counterfactual statement where you say that you frame the literature and then you position yourself really as a, as a, as a, as a counter, as an alternative to the existing ways in which the topic has previously been conceptualized. Next slide, please. Um, so the basic steps, I, again, I, I think you've seen, uh, just take, just scroll all the way through, uh, Sophia, it's fine. Um, I'm sure you've seen many of these uh, mentioned before. Uh, go back to the next slide, the previous slide. Um, so it, it's, 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 uh, it's built, built on our, the work that we've been doing on our conceptualization, but then as we're writing it up, we really need to be clear about, uh, you know, first of all, what's the topic and why that's important. 
Uh, so why is it important to think, if we stick with that same example, to think about the different ways in which sense making has been understood? Well, it's important because it's, it's an important, it has been an important concept in organization studies. It has clear implications for how people go about their working lives. Um, so it is important concept uh, as a topic to be, to be thinking about, but the concept itself has become this umbrella concept, this, this broad category of many, many different things. And in order for the concept to still be useful and to do its work, an important topic is that we clarify much more clearly what different types of sense-making are and in what situations they, they, they manifest themselves. What does current theory tell us? So this is that point about framing the common ground. Um, or you would, as part of that uh, common ground sketch, you would signify, you would signal what different traditions of sense-making scholarship there's been. You would signal what different contexts scholars have been looking at, ranging from crisis scenarios to strategic change to more, maybe slightly more routine, mundane settings. So you would capture all of that uh, in, in a good, uh, uh, good way, effective way, comprehensive way. And then the third step would be to say, well, what is really missing from that picture? Uh, what don't we know? What is real, the real problem here? And why is that important? So the real problem, if, if we stick again with that same example, is that um, we haven't previously fully and sufficiently recognize that sense-making is different things. And that's obviously what we did in that paper is that we address that complication, which, which is a concern because otherwise there's a risk that um, the concept itself would be challenged, that people would find it less useful, that it would also subsequently be less informative to practitioners and, and students. So there, there's all sorts of consequences there that, that are important. And then finally, um, um, you know, on the back of that, thinking about uh, what am I going to do to address that, that problem that is a real concern. So the course of action, uh, so in this case, it's a theory paper, but it's analogous for an empirical paper, but the course of action for a theory paper then is to say how, you know, from this reasoning perspective that we bring in, what's this new conceptualization? How does it allow us to typify these different types of sense-making how does it allow us to uh, start to conceptualize what the triggers and enablers are in different types of situations for some of these types of sense-making to occur as opposed to other types? Um, and why is that a contribution? It creates uh, a more parsimonious, elegant, theoretical formulation of what sense-making is. Uh, it addresses the big problem that was there previously. But it also is a stepping stone for asking all sorts of new questions. So how come, when and how would we see certain types of sense-making that we, that we describe in the paper to occur in certain situations as opposed to others? What would be the predictable consequences of some of these types of sense-making? So there's lots of empirical, uh, sorry, theoretical implications from uh, the contribution that we're making. So for all of your papers, uh, it's, it's a tough job, but once you've conceptualized something, you've got some ideas, try and force yourself through this type of framing and positioning set of steps so that you know, where am I going to enter the literature? What are the, the terms of the conversation? Where am I going to deviate and suggest something slightly different? What is the problem or the complication that I'm addressing and why is this of concern? Because if you do all of these things, then it's easier to build up your argument towards a, a theoretical contribution. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide in much detail, but one thing that I would say is that, uh, and Locke and Goldenbiddle is also very good on this, is that when you do this framing exercise and position your own theorizing, try and think a little bit about the rhetoric that you could be using to make, to be making the case for your theoretical contribution. So as I'm sketching the topic, try and hook the audience from the beginning of your paper. So why is this important? If it's an empirical phenomenon, um, you know, think, I mean, I mentioned uh, things like uh, the gig economy or, you know, platform organizations. Um, if, if your topic is about something like that, give facts and figures, you know, draw out why it's significant, um, 
give vivid examples, draw that in to really make the, uh, the case for looking at this topic compelling from the start. Same with the common ground, uh, and Locke and Goldenbiddle, that paper is really, really good on this. Try and not just give a synopsis or a summary of the existing literature, but try and typecast the literature in a particular way. Try and identify the different lines of research. So going back to that sense-making uh, uh, paper that I mentioned, in our case, it was a case of saying there's certain, you know, we typify certain traditions of sense-making that have looked at sense-making through a particular lens. And they've all called it sense-making, but, you know, it's important to recognize that they've been reasoning from different perspectives and different vantage points. Um, so try and typecast, characterize the literature around the topic uh, uh, in a particular way. When you problematize, also bring in a little bit of drama. Um, I can't remember if we did that in, in the case of the sense-making piece, but really draw out, not that something is a, an, over, you know, an oversight or a complication that, that, that exists, but draw out why it's important. What are the consequences of us not attending to this? And that again could be empirically. So if we don't understand better the experiences of what it's like to be a gig economy worker, or if we don't understand better how platform economies operate, that all has all sorts of consequences uh, for the people and, and for the for society. Um, so you really draw that out. But equally in the case of that uh, theoretical paper on sense making, you, know, you need to draw out the consequences of what um, continued inattention to this to this problem would lead to then the course of action and then finally the contribution and also with the contribution uh, you know try and use a nice list uh, so rhetorical list typically that's why typically contributions tend to be up to three but not more than three so it really follows the the classic rule of rhetoric to have a list of three but not more uh, so the first could be a new theoretical perspective. The second could be maybe elaborating some pathways or processes. And the third could be maybe some methodological implications arising from the work that you've been doing, but spell them out and really number them uh, accordingly. Next slide, please. Um, and I'm gonna ask if there's any questions at this point in time. I, um, I realize I've been, been trying to speed up a little bit because we lost some time at the beginning, um, and I'm I'm nearly there. So I'm seeing if there's any questions for clarification now. That would be really helpful. If not, then I could continue, and we could take all of the questions at the end. Uh, is that what do you think, Ibad? Yeah. If anyone wants to ask a question, uh, could you please, just for clarification, just please unmute yourself and ask you directly. Um, otherwise, we'll take uh, questions after the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, Len, Len has got a question, I see. Yes, uh, hi, hi, Joe. And uh, thanks for this uh, seminar, very nice. I'm, I'm working on a paper with a couple of uh, very accomplished colleagues and um, I just wanted to, to, to ask a question. We're working, we're trying to explain a phenomenon that has not been explained. And um, so we're trying to develop novel theory to explain that. But in essence, sometimes you, you can say that we know the phenomenon has not been explained and it doesn't really care. The phenomenon doesn't really care whether it's old theory or new theory that explains its being, explains its essence. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, top tier journals want us to have novel theory. So is there a balance or a trade off between using old theory, like say sense making or discourse or whatever that case might be and developing a new construct or new theory? Uh, just curious about your uh, ideas on that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's also a really good bridge to um, to the final thing I'm going to talk about, which is is ex exactly around this this very issue of um, using using established theory to uh, and, and mining that further to arrive at at, at ever greater uh, uh, at ever better explanations with more precision um, and more nuance than before, or whether 
uh, a topic, a new topic, it could be an important uh, phenomenon that is out there, uh, actually justifies theorizing about it in a very different way. Um, and that's, that's a slightly different type of theorizing. It's a slightly different type of writing a paper uh, that, I, that I can explain in, in a minute. Uh, so I'm, maybe, I could, maybe I could leave the question for, for a second and then return to it after the, uh, the final part of today. Sure, no problem. Is that okay? Yeah. Sure. That'd be great. Thank you. You know, there is a request from the YouTube translation. Um, can you restate the last point on this slide? Uh, I think it's the illustrations uh, with the examples instead of okay. the. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't there yet, so I'll I'll uh, I'll I can talk to this slide. Uh, so this Do is. Do you the... want me to go back to the previous slide, or is that was it this one? I think that was for this current one. All right. So okay. Okay. You okay. Not yet. <laughs> Yeah. Well, maybe let's let's continue then. Then I'll 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 take I'll take ten minutes more of your time. And I know I've I've run over a little bit already uh, compared to what I promised at the beginning. Um, and then and then it would be great if we could have a, a Q and A. And and the question that was just asked is is actually a very very important question. Uh, also in terms of making the case to reviewers and readers that uh, you know this topic warrants a different way of conceptualizing and understanding it. Um, and I'm going to approach this question by the final part of today, but just looking at different types of theory papers uh, in terms of what they look like, but also different forms of theorizing that, that constitute such papers. Before I get there, uh, I think it's important to bear in mind that there are different styles and types of papers, and I'll explain that in a bit more detail in a minute. Uh, some general advice that, that applies to all theory papers, and the same goes for empirical papers, but I would say particularly for theory papers, is to keep the, the topic front and center in your writing. So what I mean with that is that when you're writing about how managerial decision-making is affected by technology or how you're, when you're writing about entrepreneurial cognition in the context of developing a venture, that you, um, obviously you're, you're going to talk about theories and theorizing on those topics, but those topics need to come back into your writing. It can't be too abstract and too far out that is no longer about the context that you're speaking to. So particularly with theory papers, uh, even if they become very abstract uh, theoretical exercises, I think it's always important to bring the topic, topic back in and to make sure that you animate your writing uh, from that perspective. The second thing, and this is not easy, uh, is, is this point about clear writing. Um, I know this is very generic advice, but think about every word and sentence that you write. Uh, also think about writing simply uh, in the body of your text. Of course, you can come up, you can invent new words or you can go for, uh, so you can invent new words for constructs that you're developing. But I, I always say that in the, the body, the core of your text, try and write as simple as possible not just in terms of the sentence structure, but particularly also in terms of word choice. So don't go for difficult synonyms. Don't invent your own words in the context of the, uh, the body of the text. Try and make it as, as accessible as possible. And in many cases, the topic that you're talking about and the theorizing that you're doing is complicated enough. So if you can make your writing as accessible uh, and direct, and clean as possible, that, that, that is really, really good. And sometimes that also is quite hurtful, as I know from my own experience as an author, where you feel you've written a, a paragraph and then the next paragraph says more or less the same thing, but you've worked on it hard and it reads well and you, know, you feel you want to keep both. That also means this writing simply and good writing also means that you sometimes need to sacrifice your darlings and take out the one of the two paragraphs to, to, to benefit the paper. So being tough on yourself, editing yourself is, is, is really, really important. Uh, construct clarity plays into that, really clearly defining your concepts or constructs in your paper. And then clear writing is also, so the framing exercise that we did helps with that because that in a nutshell is already your, your storyline, but then make sure as you go through the the remainder of the paper that you keep that storyline pretty pretty clear throughout. Um, I would say use visual aids were 
where appropriate. Uh, so models, but also summary tables. And the last point, because there was a question about this, um, what I mean with this point here is that in the case of a theory paper, so this is really theory papers that you send to organization theory or to AMR or to any other journal that considers those papers. What is important is that you really focus first and foremost on the reasoning, the conceptual reasoning that is in your paper. Then it would always be great if you can give an example, a real life example maybe, or, or a vignette of some kind that speaks to your reasoning and illustrates it but it can't become a substitute for your reasoning. So when you use these illustrations, use them alongside and not instead of, of the arguments that you're themselves that you're developing. That's really the point there. Um, and that, that applies particularly to conceptual papers. Next slide, please. Um, so one thing that I mentioned at the beginning, so we're now coming back to the theory metaphor, uh, and I'm now going to, uh, explain that a bit in terms of how that works in terms of different styles of theory papers. So the theory of metaphor, we said theory could be about explanation, it could be about interpretation, and it could be about emancipation. But with explanation is this idea that theory is there to dig into these, these fundamental structures and processes that in a way lie underneath the topics that we're looking at. As I said at the beginning, sometimes in our field, people call them mechanisms or fundamental uh, mechanisms of some kind that, that determine and therefore also explain how something comes about. Um, and with an explanatory uh, tradition, uh, coming back to the question that was just asked, oftentimes what you see is that the effort is quite uh, programmatic in the sense that there are clearly particular theoretical resources, particular lenses that have been connected to particular topics. So think of a resource-based perspective or a strategy as practice view of X. So these are all fairly developed resources and literatures around topic, that, topics that, uh, that, that researchers, authors like you and me draw in to uh, as part of this explanatory effort to elaborate and to better explain a particular topic from the perspective of this tradition. Uh, so there's a, a strong emphasis with a lot of the explanatory theorizing that we see in our field to keep mining similar sets of resources. And there's a good reason for that, because if you want to keep getting closer to these fundamental underlying operations, capture them with, 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 with ever greater precision uh, and nuance, then that is what you need to do. So you need to keep mining those, those resources. Uh, and one example, so in the editorial that you might have read for today, I give three examples that are very common styles of reasoning that are very common in this explanatory tradition. The one is for theory papers, a propositional style. Another is a configurational or typological style. And the, the other one is a, a process theorizing style. And they all do different things, but all of them are trying to drive at these underlying uh, structures and processes that explain how something comes about. Uh, what is interesting about these styles is that they, in terms of you as an author, obviously you, you're not, you're still there. You're not divorced from the exercise, the, the paper that you're writing, uh, but the, the language that you use, the, the way of reasoning, is also somewhat objective. So the more formal codified uh, styles, idioms, grammars that you use to, uh, to construct and lay out your, your argument. So for instance, with propositions, the, the common propositional idiom in our field is to work off an existing conceptualization. So let's say a strategy is practice perspective or resource-based view on something and then elaborate that into, uh, into an, an extended set of arguments. And then these arguments will then be further tuned into a set of formally stated propositions. So the arguments themselves with the propositional idiom will already be about parsing uh, your explanation of the topic into these very focused if-then type transitions. So if this happens, then that is likely to follow and equally the formal propositions um, would be stated as such. And the proposition would just be a formal distillation, a statement, a summary of what you've argued up until that point. 
papers of this kind, and, and obviously uh, at organization theory, we publish papers like this. I'll give an example in a minute, but also journals like AMR will publish a lot of these explanatory styles of theorizing and propositional papers uh, in particular. Next slide, please. And here's an example um, from organization theory that, that shows this style in action. So it's a case where authors, uh, it's a very nice paper actually, where they bring two different conceptualizations together, crisis communication and discourse theory, to start to conceptualize how, um, what they call blame games, situations where organizations are being accused of misconduct, how depending on how the organizations react discursively to such an accusation, how the dynamics play out and whether ultimately you know, the, the outcome of that will be beneficial to the organization in question or, or not. Um, so they, they work of two established conceptual resources, bring them together and extend that into a set of arguments that they then formalize in terms of a set of propositions. So in that sense, very straightforward example of the propositional style, but they do that really well in this particular paper. Next slide, please. Um, and then, so the explanatory tradition is one. I, I, Coming back to the question that was asked, it, it tends to mine a lot of the existing theoretical resources. The other traditions that we see in terms of theorizing theory papers are traditions where that are inspired by, if you go back to the theory metaphor, by this interpretive activity of being reflexive as a member of a knowledge community. So in this case, our academic community, and based on that reflexivity, asking yourself, how have we been thinking about a topic in a particular way? And could we think about it in different and better ways? Um, and the, the, the job there, so it's a really interpretive activity. Um, so Gadamer would probably say it's, it's um, you're re-signifying something, you're recontextualizing a topic and the way in which it's been conceptually understood up until this point and offer an alternative take, which is effectively what we did with that sense-making piece that I referred to. Uh, and one example, so the more examples in this category of, of theorizing where authors are leaping or conceptually abstracting or conceptually uh, recontextualizing understandings and reframing understandings. So they're doing many more creative things compared to uh, what we typically see in the explanatory tradition. Um, in, 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 this, in this style that is, we would say, informed by interpretive uh, thinking, um, you can either recast existing theoretical understanding of a topic, like the sense-making example, or you can bring a new topic in, a topic that previously has not been addressed, that should be addressed in its own terms. They can't be uh, mapped or fully captured by the theories that already exist. So you can also bring in a new topic with a perspective piece like this. So again, it's being a member of this knowledge community. You're saying that, yes, we've been through all of our resources, been looking at these types of topics, but here's a topic that hasn't been looked at. And here's, by the way, also uh, an adequate framing for that particular topic for us to understand it. And I'll, I'll give you an example in, in a minute. So this is a more interpretive style of theorizing and we, label it at OT, we call it a perspective piece, um, because in a way you go beyond um, existing resources. You also go beyond existing topics by bringing in new topics and then maybe just offering the topic, but also, uh, as I said, you could also offer the topic and then show how it could be framed in a particular way, theoretically for, for further research. Uh, maybe next slide, and I'll, I'll because I think an example will be useful. Um, so it's a nice paper, uh, but there are more examples of this in our in our journal. But there's a nice paper by J.P. Fern, where he looks at platform organizations, <clears throat> and he he actually it's very interesting when you look at his paper. Um, so obviously this is an emergent new phenomenon that platform organizations, big ones, think of Amazon, Facebook, etc. Uh, but also smaller ones, but the platform economy is there. It's becoming a very big part of the uh, the real economy in, in many societies around the world. 
So it's an important topic that he's bringing in. He's obviously not the very first person to be doing that, but he's bringing the topic in in a way that is a bit different from how previously people have been doing that. So he's not talking about platform organizations from a, you know, a two-sided market perspective that economists or strategy scholars do. He's talking about platform organizations uh, through differences in their core technologies. So he's talking about differences between some platform organizations being based on machine learning, others being based on blockchain technologies. So what is interesting in the paper is that he immediately moves to that core problem of a fundamental theoretical problem of sort of disentangling distribution from decentralization that allows him to capture differences, fundamental differences between platform organizations in terms of how they organize themselves based on machine learning versus blockchain. And then he draws out the implications of that for our better thinking, our better perspective that we now can have of these different types of platform organizations and also how they should be regulated. So in the, in the essay, he makes some really strong points um, also towards legislators in terms of how they should be thinking about the variety of platform organizations that they encounter and how they should be legislating uh, accordingly. So here's an example of bringing in a new topic, but also simultaneously re-signifying the topic of platform organizations, reframing it, offering a deeper, different reading of the phenomenon than existed previously in the strategy and economics sphere through this notion of a very organizational theory heavy notion of disentangling decentralization from distribution. So perspective pieces like this, they do this type of job. So they bring in a new topic and then often they also reframe it in, 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 in obviously a, a very distinct and different manner compared to what, what went before. And then the final, final example, um, the final style. Uh, so you have explanatory traditions, propositional, configurational process theorizing. A lot of process theorizing is in that explanatory tradition, not all of it, but most, a lot of it is. Then you have these more interpretive or informed by interpretive thinking traditions that, uh, so think of acts of meta theorizing, but also think of these perspective pieces that bring in new topics or really reframe theoretically our understanding of a, of a given topic. Um, and then the third type, as we said at the beginning already, is this emancipatory style of theorizing. And in this tradition, you do in some ways similar things to uh, you know, the perspective piece that we've just seen. So you're also trying to question received wisdom on uh, and received theoretical um, thinking on a particular topic. But there's a slightly more normative, stronger normative take here. You really try to question, fundamentally question some of the, uh, the assumptions that we've been working from. You try to argue for an alternative. You try to open, create an opening for an alternative way of understanding. Uh, so there's stronger on the critique and also stronger on the ideals, the utopia, if you like, that you want to argue for of how things could be different or should be different. Um, so that's where it's slightly different, we think, from the uh, perspective piece in that uh, that we've just seen, in that it's much stronger in the uh, in the normative take. So here you're more involved and active as a as a theorist, as a as an as a as a as a scholar in your writing. You're actually positioned, and with your critique, you also try to to create something, to create some change, to create that opening. Next slide, please. Uh, and an example also from OT that does this well is uh, a paper that uh, critiques uh, the assumptions that have been, uh, that people have been working from previously when they've been thinking about diversity research. So the critique is here towards these, these root uh, images of uh, diversity as limited to uh, the firm, as limited to a contained organization. Um, that they feel has really limited also our ways of thinking about what diversity is and what it could be. And it has also limited us in ways of thinking about diversity only reaching to the boundaries of the organization, not to you know, all the areas of economic activity. So think of global supply chains, for instance, 
that organizations are also involved in and where they also work with, uh, with different parties and where diversity equally matters. Um, so they critique the, the received view, all of the conceptual resources and thinking about diversity in, in many of the established literatures in HRM and industrial relations. And then they offer an alternative. So they give us some examples in the paper uh, that, that help us grasp what this alternative is. And as you can see with the last line, it's quite important. It's about this opening, opening up. So it's, a, it's quite a damning critique of past work, but it's also towards an opening up of possibilities for new conversations around diversity in, in, in a completely different and a much more politically sensitive light than, than before. Okay, um, let me just wrap up. Um, and I should have said actually these three types of theorizing, explanatory, uh, interpretive, and emancipatory, they're explained a little bit more in an editorial that will be publishing soon with, uh, with organization theory. And, and the idea is that, uh, so you may have read the editorial I wrote previously for AMR, so these are really three classic explanatory types of theorizing for theory papers. With our editorial for organization theory now, we're trying to say that beyond the three in that tradition, there's two more in the interpretive and there's two more in the emancipatory tradition that are, are equally important. And we'll, we'll explain them in the ed editorial in a bit more detail together with some examples. So that again, you can have a really good grasp, we hope, uh, based on our writing, uh, so we'll see whether that will come across, but hopefully we'll, you'll get a very good grasp of these different types, these different styles of theorizing uh, and how you can use them yourselves as you're writing a theory paper. So next slide, please. And then the final um, set of comments from my side. So um, I've tried to give you a bit of a roadmap in terms of thinking about the, uh, the theory development of your paper. Uh, I realized that I've been gearing a bit towards theory papers in, 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 for the most part, but a lot of what I said, I hope you appreciate, also applies to empirical papers. Uh, and at the end now, I've given you a sense of different styles of theorizing uh, and different types of theory papers that you can see within each of these, these different traditions. Um, and the, the key there is to really recognize them for what they are. There's no one better than the propositional style is not necessarily better than a theoretical provocation. Uh, they all do different things. They all allow us to understand uh, our topics of interest in different ways. They ask us, they allow us to ask different types of questions to recognize that they all offer something and that together they, uh, and this is a real strength of our discipline, I think, together they, they, they give us better and much deeper answers than any one of these styles or traditions alone would give. But for you personally, it would mean that think about these styles of theorizing and writing and then, then model yourself on one of them. So try and really grasp the style sufficiently well so that you and your writing can really perfect it as much as you can and be, be persuasive with your writing and, and, and that a great paper will, will come out on, on the back of that. Uh, I think I should stop here because I've gone way over. I said I would be 40 minutes, but it took me way longer. Uh, but I'm very, very keen to to hear some questions and, and to help you in whatever way I can. I have a question. Can I stop uh, sharing the screen so that we can all see each other? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Yup. Um, yes, let's open it up for questions. And I, there are lots of questions in the chat, Yup, uh, especially on, on the YouTube. Uh, we have twice as many people uh, on YouTube than on, on, on uh, Zoom. So lots of interesting questions. Perhaps just we will What's do we'll combine um, we'll combine a, some of the questions from the chat with the questions that people want to ask directly. That's okay. Perhaps I could start with some of the questions in the chat, just because they were asked earlier. Um, in the meantime, if you want to ask a question directly, could you please um, use the reactions button to raise your hand, please? That way we'll know um, whom to call forward to ask question. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Yup. And one of the questions is, where do you start? Boy, so many interesting questions. Um, maybe, maybe 
we'll start with um, this one from Tulin. Um, when we theorize using illustrative cases, boundary between the empirical context and the concepts become blurry. Any suggestions on this problem of conceptual papers with illustrative cases? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really, really good question. Um, so one, uh, what I said in the slide is actually really important. I think in a way for yourself, it's good to bear in mind that <clears throat> a good test for yourself is does the argument stand without the illustration? Uh, so have I uh, written out my argumentation in a, in, a, in a detailed and persuasive enough manner so that it stands, so it's persuasive, it's compelling without having to use the illustration. Um, and I think that's an important test because the difficulty is that if you somehow, the alternative where you already mesh the two together, where you, some, you, you, you bring in the empirical example as the grounds for your theorizing, for the claims that you're deriving, for the, in a way, the inferences that you're making, there's a risk that it becomes a bit like a closet inductive theory building paper. Um, so like effectively a qualitative empirical uh, paper. Um, and that's where I'm not the only one giving that advice for theory papers where people often say that, yes, it's great to have illustrations and examples, but if you draw them in as the, so to speak, the grounds or the basis for your theoretical claims, uh, then it becomes a bit problematic. Um, so it's better to separate the two. So let's say if I'm working on entrepreneurship and I've, I've got this wonderful quote from, uh, or maybe a vignette, more like an extended illustration of Steve Jobs. Let me write out, let's say if it's about pitching, you know, how to, how, what, what are successful aspects that I reason uh, about of, of pitching. And then I use, and maybe Steve Jobs is a bit of an outlier, but I use an example like the Steve Jobs example to, to illustrate uh, my reasoning. But, uh, but my advice would be try and keep it separate as much as you can and bring in the illustration afterwards once you've laid out your reasoning sufficiently well, because otherwise there's a risk that it becomes a bit yeah, murky and it becomes, you know, the, 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 the illustration could become effectively the grounds for your claim, at least partially or to, to a greater extent. I hope that answers the question. But, yeah. Thank you, you. Um, let's ask someone to ask questions just in the order of appearance uh, of raising hand. Friedhoff, would you like to go next? Yes, uh, thank you for the, the interesting presentation. Um, I really like the emancipatory aspect that, that you mentioned because that is some authors write about that, but I haven't read about this really in, in this kind of more theoretical work. And what I, what I specifically am challenged with is how do you theorize but stay close to practice? So, because it, it seems almost like a lot of authors, they, they kind of like feel they need to go very away, far away from practice to show that they're really theoretical. But, uh, and, and we also discussed that a bit before, but like how, how can we build theory that stays close to practice, but that, that shows, so to say, the, these connections that allow us to see something better, see something that, that, that could improve things. And, and that, so it's, it's not... I think it's not theorizing away, but it's kind of, it's, it's a different kind of theorizing, but do you have any tips for that? How do you theorize closer to practice? Uh, yeah, I, I think, I think there are, there's actually two parts to your question. I think, I think the emancipatory um, approach is, is, is um, and in, in the editorial, we talk about two different types. So this theoretical provocation, which is really about important uh, topics in society where typically instances of suppression or uh, a lack of diversity, workplace racism, you know, topics that we haven't really considered to bring them in, or as in the case of the, uh, the, the Janssen and Sononi piece to say, um, they're also saying bring other types of diversity settings in, but they're also saying, let's, let's really theoretically criticize and, and fundamentally rethink how we've been thinking about diversity conceptually and do that differently moving forward. And I would say in, in these types of scenarios, you, with your theorizing, you're obviously hoping to influence um, fellow academics, but you can also influence people out there. So there's also a real direct difference and opening that you can, can create in the conversations that happen there. And let me give you another example. So I mentioned at the beginning, the, uh, the battle that is now going on about uh, the gig economy, for instance. Uh, and, and that's, that's to a, 
a degree, a very conceptual discussion. You know, should, should we recognize as employment categories a third one beyond independent contractor and, and, and the classic sort of employee? Um, so here's a case where if I were to write a paper like that, I could do a theoretical provocation that really critiques the way in which some people have, and mostly economists at this point, have been suggesting that there should be a third category reflecting that part of activity, significant activity that uh, Deliveroo, Uber, you know, all of these uh, companies create in terms of people having these types of gift gigs, having these types of jobs. So I could critique it, but with that, I could also immediately be of relevance to policy discussions, to um, you know, people thinking about these issues. So, so I think, uh, and I could do some heavy lifting theoretically for that, depending on how I want to attack this a problem like this. Yes, that 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 theoretical abstract work may be needed, but I think often, uh, as in this case, you can also really make with that. Uh, a real difference directly to um, to the people affected. So think also of you know there's a, there's um, a lot of well not a lot but there is there is uh, there is a good strand of work post colonial work looking at also things like workplace racism or diversity. Equally, that's theoretically very uh, deep work if you think about it in terms of the intellectual traditions that it comes from. But equally there, I would say there's an immediate impact uh, on potentially on, on society for how to think about these issues. Yeah. And, and the same, I know with your work, Fritjof, on uh, performativity, which, um, you know, if it's the sort of critical performativity lens, uh, it's obviously a difference that you're making to the academic community to be recasting things, thinking about topics through a performativity lens differently. But again, equally there, you could make that could be directly extended into practice. Um, thank you, you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Just another question from from the chat. Uh, Katarina is asking, what kind of advice could you give for theorizing in a paper based only on a single case study, even having strong data set? Some reviewers find theoretical contributions here anecdotal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, cool. It's it's. Um, uh, I'm, I'm I'm now reminded of uh, I was reading something um, in economics the the other day, and uh, it was apparently a description of how economists sometimes say that if you bring in empirical data, apart from working with really highly stylized abstractions of uh, of individual agents as economic actors. Uh, how if you bring in empirical evidence that's only anecdotal and it was mentioned in a very uh, derogatory, uh, judgmental manner. Um, I think your question is more one case as opposed to a comparative case uh, set up. I think in the interpretive tradition, there's a lot of, uh, so if you think about grounded theory, for instance, there's a lot of um, recognition in that part of qualitative research field that you can work with single cases. It's probably true that there's now an expectation that within the case you have enough data, so enough interview, enough interviews, enough secondary data, maybe also some observations that allow you to to work with that data set and and allow you to to be theorizing over something where there's enough data to to work with. So I think that is maybe one way to address this challenge of it being seen as, as anecdotal, that if you really can um, show and tell, uh, so, so talk about your case, but also show the data that, that ground the inferences that you're making and the, the ground of theory that you're developing, then I think that would probably go a long way towards addressing that. Um, but it, it yeah, I mean, it depends on who, who said the anecdotal. If, if it's, I think in the qualitative community, people recognize that you can work with one case. Maybe in, in other parts of the community that may need a little bit more convincing. Thank you, you. Um, Amit, would you like to go next? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I think it was a wonderful uh, presentation and I learned a lot about theory development today than I think uh, with the papers I have read. 
So thanks a lot for organizing and thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, my question is like, uh, when I was looking at your presentation, you talked about incomplete, the research is incomplete, inadequate or incommensurable. So in an incomplete situation, suppose there is a particular construct which has been looked as an antecedent to some of the outcomes, some of the organization outcomes, but it has not been looked as an out uh, as an antecedent to some other outcomes. Will that also be in the incomplete form or does that require an empirical work only and it can't be part of the theoretical uh, aspect? So how do we deal with the such cases? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a very good question. I um. So when I, I started in, in, um, in working in business schools, I, I actually started teaching in marketing departments and my colleagues there always said, you, know, you, need, to, you, need, to, you need to start with one uh, theoretical uh, model that already exists. And then you need to, to you know, change something in that, what they said was a nomological net, a, a set of, of, of uh, you know, vocabulary of how concepts were related. So typically antecedents, focal constructs, and some performance outcomes. And one thing that, that they advised me to do, my marketing colleagues at the time, but we're talking 20 years ago, is to really play, basically do what you just said, sort of play with, with antecedents, uh, think about you know, other contexts that you could be looking at, think about moderators or mediators, if, if so we're talking quantitative survey-based work uh, here, which was common at the time. Um, and I think that fits really well with, as you said, with the incomplete option, because there you're saying, uh, so I'm taking this theoretical perspective. So let's say the commitment trust theory of relationship marketing. I take that perspective as a given. I accept all of its underlying theoretical assumptions. I accept the, the core concepts and the measures that have been developed around that. But what I'm doing is that I'm, I'm, I'm interrogating that framework a bit more because I think it's incomplete. There's things missing and I'm now adding a moderator or a mediator or I'm adding maybe another performance consequence. So I'm rejigging the causal map a little bit uh, to get to a more complete understanding compared to what existed uh, before. So I think what you're describing sounds to me, but I'm not no longer a quantitative researcher. Uh, I've never really become one, actually, despite the best efforts of my marketing colleagues. But um, I think what you're describing is, is pretty much in, in that camp. So it's incomplete. And then the, the task for you is to say, as you're rejigging this, why is this an important complication? What would it allow us to now do and address and understand better, explain better, in this case, than what we could do previously uh, because just rejigging may be just that. So you really need to uh, spell out why that's important and why that helps that particular theoretical framework uh, progress further. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Sergey. Thank you, Brad. Um, you, I, I was watching the, um, the translation on YouTube we, we had seven, more, more than 700 people. So I've made a compilation of wow. uh, questions. So I think I have a, a chance to ask you only three. All right, if okay. I, so I will start with the most difficult one. We have a question from Pang Zhuyu. She is the first year PhD student and she asks, how should we learn? How should we learn to write theories? Is it a good way for us, uh, for us to read good articles and try to emulate, try to um, steal the concepts and the way of argumentation, or should we start from the other, other point, from uh, reading the guidance and books? And uh, so uh, I will carry on if, if, if I may. The second question is on the falsification and uh, verification of theories, all right? So what's your perspective? And the third question, uh, what, do we need to address when we are testing theories on the so what question? So to which point do we apply this? So three questions. Thank you very much, Job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, I think the first question is, a, is actually a very, very good question. So how, how can we learn this? And that applies to both empirical and, and theory papers. I think a lot of it 
is is a craft and it's it's about you developing yourself so the the focus is also it's very self-referential how can i you know become a better uh, social scientist or scholar but also that means in this case also how can i become a better writer effectively in the in the that's the word i've chosen for this the idiom that i've chosen so if i want to write and uh, a propositional theory building paper so a propositional theory paper that's one idiom but if you're doing um hypothesis deductive testing based on a survey or an experiment then that's another type and in each of these different types that's why it's actually quite difficult to to uh, to master all of them at the same time so so i think for my side i can write theory papers and some qualitative empirical papers, but it would be really hard for me to write an experimental paper or to write yet a, again another type. So, because you need you need the time and the, the the skill development in each of these different types to to really to really get there. I think I would say yes, it's important to to take all of the resources that you can get at your that are at your disposal and make make use of them. So editorials. Uh, deconstructing papers in that particular idiom, look at papers that really inspire you and that you want to emulate maybe in some senses. Um, but then, so all of this is formative, I would say. At the same time, uh, it's really about your development as, as, a, as a social scientist and, and your skills as a writer. So there will always be the need to practice this, to perfect your skills. So you will need to have, need to keep writing and and that's, yeah, that's that's a sometimes challenging. That's challenging for all of us, and and maybe particularly so when we start out or when we're not a native English speaker. Um, but it, it just requires this painstaking work of doing it and doing it again. And and you will see as you're doing it that you'll progress quite quickly. Um, I've seen the same with. When I ask, uh, I don't know if you're a PhD student, but I'll, I'll give you the example in any case. But when I ask PhD students to look at a, a, a paper, an, an actual submission for AMR or OT or JMS, and we do an exercise where I ask them to, to write a review. And then after the exercise, I show them what the actual reviewers, so board members of those journals said, said on that paper. And then what students are often surprised by is how close they are to the actual comments that were made by uh, what they think and, and are very experienced uh, board members. Meaning that uh, if, you, if you keep engaging with what you do, if you keep working at it, uh, your skills will develop. Um, and you will need to give yourself a little bit of time for that. But if you keep going at it, if you keep writing and perfecting your skills in that particular idiom, over time you will see that you will gradually become better and, and, uh, and that your work also with that will gradually become better. But there's no substitute for experience, I'm afraid. That's the, uh, the difficulty. Yeah, the other question. Um, so maybe, maybe I can take the so what question first. I think the falsification verification one is, is a tough one. Um, I think I interpret the so what question about um, the sort of general response that you often hear about, so what, what's the added value of, of what you're doing here? And a lot of that really comes down to that point in the framing steps that we looked at around complication and concern. Uh, so you problematize something, that's the complication, but you also show why that's of concern. So it has real distributive consequences. So if I can link back to that paper that I mentioned on diversity, the point they're making is that if we keep thinking about diversity in these conceptually narrow terms, this has real distributive consequences for people at work. You know, some people will be marginalized. Uh, companies will limit their responsibilities. So these are really, really significant uh, empirical consequences. So then the question of why should I care about this and why should I be convinced by your argument? Because they make such a compelling case around the complication and the concern is that it's easier for me to, uh, to, to accept that and to work with them, to, to buy their, their argument. So I think the so what is, 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 is 
also it's it's obviously around many different aspects of your writing, but it it also often boils down to those two uh, two points. Then falsification and verification. Um, what's the question? I, I can't. What's the question? Whether the strength of theories depend on falsification or verification? Can you remind me? Um, I will. I will read the the question uh, how it was formulated by the. Um by the author. So um, is it correct to say that a theory is never proven? Is it more correct to say that theory is supported or not supported by the research results to varying degrees? So to what degree we can say that the, our results support? Yeah, our... yeah. I mean, I, I can give a personal take on that. Um, I, I tend to agree with that. I think, um, so what I also described with these different practices of theorizing, they give us different answers. They give us different ways of understanding and thinking about essentially the same topics. Um, it's only in the explanatory tradition, not everywhere, but in some parts of discussions in the explanatory tradition, that there is a belief that over time we'll keep progressing to some type of grand theory that fully explains and, and has strong predictive power as, as well. Um, I think, you know, if we think about many of the established theories in our field, um, so the ones that were the big ones from the 1970s, institutional theory, population ecology, but also think about economic theories of the firm or resource-based view. I think a lot of these theories have, have accumulated, have made a lot of progress, have accumulated a lot of evidence but whether they've already arrived at that stage of, of the one grand theory that, that maximally explains a particular topic and has this strong predictive ability, I, I doubt it. Uh, and from my side, I, I like to believe that however valuable that work is to be striving towards those stronger explanations and also predictions, I think the other camps also add something significant. So like the um, examples that I gave you in the emancipatory uh, approach to theorizing, as well as in the interpretive approach, it will give you, uh, so take that perspective piece of JP Fern. He offers us a way of thinking about platform organizations that has potentially real mileage, theoretically, as well as in practice, in terms of influencing um, uh, legislators, influencing people out there that in some form or way are, are affected by platform organizations. Um, does he develop a grant theory of platform organizations? No, um, but he gives us a way, so theory is a tool, he gives us a way for thinking about these types of organizations in, in relatively speaking better and more incisive ways than we could previously. Um, so I think it depends also a bit the falsification or this question of, of of theory progress in terms of where you stand. I mean, my position is that uh, set of, you know, diversity of theorizing traditions, different perspectives, different approaches, different answers, different forms of understanding actually get us further, if you want to use that metaphor, than you know, the one explanatory tradition that assumes that we're progressively going to move towards uh, you know, the grand theory that rules them all. Thank you very much, Job, for answering the questions from our YouTube audience, and I th I hope they feel more engaged to the to go today. Uh, Ibrad, back to you. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have three people who raised their hands. Why don't we give them a chance to ask their question? Um, Lekha, would you like to go next? Yes, sure. Um, thank you, Joy. Thank you, Ibrad. Thank you, everybody, for such a wonderful session. Uh, my question was with respect to the three types of theorizing that Joe had mentioned. Uh, and the question was some, it could be a silly thing to say, like everybody says, but yeah, that's what, I, what that's I'm thinking right now. The first type, uh, which is, my question is that does, it, does the type of theorizing that we select for a paper depend on the stage of our career or the stage of our PhD life? Uh, why I ask this is because as an early PhD scholar, uh, I'm reading up things and trying to understand the phenomenon, trying to understand the theories, etc. So for me to unlock the phenomenon comes naturally and to write 
becomes easier to write such papers become easier uh, at the same time unless and until i understand the phenomenon and i have mastered the art of understanding or cracking the phenomenon concept i will not be able to reflect and then write interpretative papers and as a natural extension of that again unless and until i am able to reflect on certain topics i will not be able to ask questions or counter question you know some semantic thoughts or papers etc so for me i look at it as a natural extension of each other these three theorizing topic the three theorizing processes that you talk about is it a wrong way of looking at it or is it just plainly the topic or you know the knowledge that you have have about that particular topic how do i look at it as a as a student or as a phd student yeah um I think I'm, I'm trying to to fully fully um, grasp your question. So is the question more about picking a particular style of theorizing, or is the question more about should I be following the literature in terms of the theories that circulate around the topic in the literature, or should I do something creative and different? Is that is... no? I'm saying that uh, for me as a PhD student, writing an explanatory paper would be. Relatively easier, yeah, is it sure. interpretative yeah. or emancipatory? And <coughs> yeah, sure. at the second stage, yeah, maybe yeah. more interpretative, yeah, 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 and yeah. a more advanced stage, yeah, yeah. maybe an emancipatory. Yeah. So, is there a yeah. step that you know you should be you should be following, or it just depends? I, I I I would say it depends. I I don't think that the one is necessarily harder than the other, uh, because I think they're all by themselves they're hard enough. In the sense that if you really want to write a good propositional paper, um, yeah, that that's hard uh, to to really get that down to the detail where it stands up and where it can make that strong contribution. And the same goes for a theoretical provocation piece. Um, I think as uh, so, I I, I I like to believe, and, and maybe our editorial will help a little bit with that. That once we've deconstructed some of these different types, it's easier to pick them up and to say, you know, I'm now following, or I'm, I'm following in this way of theorizing and I have a better sense of how I can configure my paper, lay out the line of argument in, in that particular way. So I, I like to believe that. So they're just equally valid choices, equally good choices in some senses. And, and it's for you to pick and to perfect the art and the skill of writing in that particular uh, idiom. Um, I, yeah, I've got a slight sense in me that you're probably right that, and then I'm also thinking about my own experience. <clears throat> when I, the, the papers that I've written theory wise, uh, you know, the ones that are more perspective pieces or more meta theoretical are, yeah, require maybe slightly more than a straightforward, so to speak, propositional paper. Sometimes, not all of the time, but I've found it sometimes easier to bring the conceptualization of a topic down to just a basic set of arguments and a basic set of propositions. Um, so I, I would say, so not, not all of the time, but sometimes I felt that. So I've done a paper recently with colleagues where, you know, we've been quite abstract first and then you know, try to make all sorts of connections and then we brought it down to a, a very simple set of propositions. I think for you, it's more a case of, of maybe try it out. So try out, um, you know, look at the editorials, uh, try out, uh, look at, for instance, a propositional paper or process theorizing paper, whatever you think now intuitively makes sense. Try it out, write, write it up and, and then see what it looks like and see whether you feel you're making progress and you're approaching the, the form sufficiently well. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe it's easier to start with um, the explanatory traditions because you can piggyback on the theory that already exists and you can use that and you can work with those concepts and those basic assumptions and then elaborate a the line of argument that you, uh, that you, um, Sort of structure around a set of propositions, for instance, maybe that's that's a good way of doing it, and that at least gives you a good practice already in writing a theory paper and what it what it might look like, and and then if it's in a good form, I would definitely encourage you to uh, submit it to uh, a good journal. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, you. And Sasia, would you like to go next? 
Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Anastasia and I'm a PhD student at Temple University in Philadelphia. Uh, thank you so much for letting me ask the question. Um, my question uh, refers to this part about finding your way and maybe it's a little bit more about logistics and details, but it's about, uh, the, you mentioned a lot of things about um, drawing out, mapping out things, conducting thought trials. And I have a very technical question. How do you prefer to do it? Is it pen and paper visual maps? Because I get, I like, there's a lot of thinking and thoughts gets messy. And I just wanted to see if there's any particular tools or things you do to help you make sense of things and keep track of your notes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's a very good question. <clears throat> so I, I, I think that is different for every person. So I, I, I can reflect on myself and I, I know that I uh, find it very, well, not easy, but I'm, I'm pretty comfortable for myself to keep it all in my head and maybe, a, you know, a few sheets of papers, paper, but not, not too much. So I don't need to have a very detailed mapping of all of the things that I've read. I can remember most things and can sort of remember how I think they're sort of connected. Um, but then in other cases, I've seen with, with colleagues what they find helpful, which I, I actually think have come to realize is a very good, good practice. So some make, as you say, these, these uh, mental models for themselves. Uh, the other trick that I've seen, which is really, really helpful, I think, is to draw out a table for yourself. So if you think about the different conceptual resources that you can connect to your topic, you know, draw out a table with you know, what is the perspective? What are some of the core assumptions? What is the level of analysis? What are some of the core concepts? What is this tradition found? What have they looked at? You know, you know, you can think of the dimensions yourself, but if you have a comparative table like that, it's a good way into a literature. So if I go back to, we didn't do that, but if I go back to that sense-making paper that I mentioned, you could just, you know, you could just list all of the traditions of sense-making, what is their core definition of sense-making, what do they see as the core triggers or enablers of sense-making, what are, you know, basic assumptions. Um, and I think if you do, if you do, it, if you make a table like that, it gives you immediately a good synthesis of the literature and at the level of theory. So you can immediately see how might things be connected, where has the relative emphasis been and where has it not been? Uh, can I make a leap somehow that brings some of this together or that maybe challenges some of this? So as an alternative perspective on, on this particular topic. Um, so I think, I mean, I don't do it enough, but I've seen colleagues who do this really, really well. So to draw out these mind maps, but also to make these comparative tables is, is, is actually a really good trick, I think. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Because we only see the front end when there is a publication and deconstructing, it's the front end, but the back end might be very messy and have all these extra steps. That yeah, and that's, that's actually also a point that we didn't touch on that, you know, the papers that you see published have benefited tremendously from the, the developmental nature of the review process. That's not how papers come in. So, uh, so bear that in mind as well, that, that, also from your own perspective, when you write a theory or empirical paper, it just needs to be good enough to get into the review process and to make it past the first step of being sent out to review and then hopefully getting a, an r, r It doesn't need to be, you know, you don't need to emulate necessarily, you know, a paper that you think is great and that has been published in a good journal. Um, it, it just needs to be good enough, you know, competently done, well-written, uh, that's it. Thank you. Rita? Yeah, hi, I'm Rita. I'm also doing my PhD. I am, I'm about a year and a half down and I'm at Young Shipping International Business School. And I just wonder, uh, my question is more of just to get an idea of what <coughs> you think about a uh, theory paper that consists, that try to, tries to in fact uh, introduce a uh, new theory, let's say build, based on a current phenomena that is under discussion, um, within literature, but uh, yes, introduces in, it through a process model and explains uh, the theory through the process model, but also consists of uh, prepositions that help us go deeper that perhaps can later be also yeah. used. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Both. Yeah. What yeah. is your view on that? 
Um, in terms of combining these 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 different styles, I I, I think um, as I explained in that editorial that you might have read for today, I think that often happens. So and that's not a bad bad thing. Um, so there's quite a few process papers that um, that then lead into propositions. And what they do is that if you think of an extended process, they they pick the transitions between important stages of that process, and then the transitions will be formalized as a as a proposition. And that 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 is completely legitimate. So, um, so the thing to bear in mind with these 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 types of papers is that in a way they're ideal types. You know, they're ideals that that may look and there may be actual papers that look a lot like you know the ideal type propositional paper. But then there are papers that do a bit of mix and match or do, do a bit of, are a bit in between maybe, or make combinations. And, and that's also fine. Uh, I think the test for yourself is to make sure that it, it still needs to work within a, a paper. It still needs to be theoretically coherent. So like that example that I gave you, and, and that may be your paper, um, you know, it's, it's completely logical step essentially to move from that process to uh, formalizing the, the turning points in that process. Um, so it, need, it, it needs to hang together in that sense. And, and, um, and it also needs to be manageable and, and still within the size of a paper. If, if it means that your paper becomes 18 or 20,000 words or longer, then, then may, maybe you're doing too many different things in the same paper at the same time. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You, I'm conscious of time. Uh, it's been nearly two hours. Um, perhaps just for, for, for as a closing one, maybe I could ask a question you as well, if you don't mind. You, you alluded a lot to understanding the literature and analyzing literature and, and uh, breaking it down and you know, uncovering assumptions, et cetera. Um, but you also touched on the idea, you know, Wyke's idea of imagination. Yeah. Um, how much in theorizing, particularly, I don't know, um, maybe it depends on type of theorizing you're doing and um, whether you're extending or developing your theory, how much imagination plays a role and, you know, and how much energy or effort do you spend on stepping away from the literature yeah. to the process yeah. and to rethink perhaps? I don't know if, you under if I'm clear. Yeah, yeah. I, I... So I, I think it's a very good question. And, and um, I suppose one way of answering it is that if you think back to that disciplined imagination cycle that White talked about, so he makes the point that for yourself, it's good to go through these thought trials that are quite heterogeneous. So meaning that if I think of a particular topic, let's give myself the benefit to really think in many multiple ways about how it could be conceptualized. Because when I do that, I can also make more informed choices. Bear in mind that sometimes the choice that I make is still for the resource that is within the literature, so to speak, you know, that is the dominant or default perspective. And that's perfectly fine. So if, if my disciplined imagination means that as part of me imagining and reflecting, I opt in the end for the, the resource that already has is, is familiar, is the default frame on this particular topic, that, that's perfectly fine. But as you say, it may also mean that you're not just reflectively making an informed choice for what already exists, so to speak, as a resource, but that you also start to imagine what, what alternatives could be. Um, and I think that's really important because that's where theory building comes in, that's where new concepts come in, new theoretical perspectives. Um, so like um, and, and, and that's also, uh, if you think about it, what the strength is of particularly that interpretive and also the critical emancipatory tradition. What these do is to really push back on received knowledge. And in, so think back to the interpretive perspective piece example, you're really trying to bring in a new framing of either a new topic or an already existing topic, uh, but you're really trying to push the boundaries and, and you've imagined so theoretical imagination, a process of so speculating, thought experimenting, abstracting, being creative, uh, counterfactual problematizing assumptions, all of that comes in that uh, tradition because you're trying to think about what else there could be. 
So how could I recontextualize uh, our ways of understanding this particular topic in a deeper or better way than, than we did previously? Um, and that is, that is immensely useful. Uh, so yes, we need to have a lot of us working on explanatory work, trying to you know, move one and two steps forward in, in that explanatory drive. But we also need the injection of new theory. We need uh, disciplines, but forms of imagination that, that allows us to, to come up with these new concepts and these new perspectives. Um, and luckily we do get that uh, and we do need that because that's how these new topics that are out there in society, how they come in. That's how new perspectives that potentially make all the difference academically, theoretically to us as academics, but also to practitioners out there are being developed. Uh, so we need to allow for that type of imagination that type of thought experimentation, a type of theoretical speculation also to, to take place and to have its place within our community, not just mining the, uh, with however important that also is, mining the resources that we already have around certain sets of topics. Um, hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, uh, Sergey, I can see you raising your hand. Did you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, I wanted to ask a follow-up question. Um, so on the other side of the spectrum, right, imagination. Right? So uh, there is a need for a robustness in our theories. So in qualitative research, so what's your perspective on counting evidence, right? So there are extreme examples. For example, Sigmund Freud was criticized for exaggerating and reconstructing his evidence and the number of cases is anecdotally low. Right. Uh, sometimes um, authors, I don't know, being led by reviewers, are providing uh, tables in which they um, indicate the number of um, of informants who express certain uh, certain con concepts. On the other side, qualitative researchers say that uh, a single child saying the emperor has no clothes is enough. All right, so we don't need to seek safety in numbers. So what's your perspective? Where is the line is, uh, is less blurred? Imagination and the support, should we count words or should we dismiss the idea of quantitative tools in qualitative research? Um, you have to ask, I think your question is more about qualitative research. So I, I think there, uh, what, what you often see with much qualitative research is that uh, when people work with data is that there's some type of abductive leap being made. So you, um, you know, you, you are obviously true to um, the perspectives of your informants, to your first order data. You'll, you'll try to represent that and, and, and honor that as, as, as best as you can. But then you're going to conceptually abstract from that. And that will be partly inductively looking for patterns and concepts that you see in the data, but in many cases, there will also be an abductive leap where you go back to existing theory and then see what else might be going on here that could potentially be, uh, be of interest. I think in, in most cases, I would assume that people would be taking that, uh, going through that process with a lot of integrity. So really trying to um, uh, I, I can't speak to Sigmund Freud, but um, or to how he gathered his data and how he worked with it. But I'm sure that a lot of qualitative researchers would be would be handling the data that they have with integrity, and would be going through their reasoning, through their inferential steps as to making those theoretical abstractions, and as they imagine how potentially this case could be interpreted or explained, that they do that with a lot of integrity and care. And when they do that. And they show you how they arrived at their inferences and give you also as a reader enough of an opportunity to get a, a grasp of their data so that they really uh, show you the data besides telling you about it and, and giving their conclusions and their theoretical claims. Um, I think then, yeah, then I, I think it will be quite, quite, quite convincing. Then um, you're question about the amount of data. I, I, uh, so I'm showing my age now, but uh, when I started editing, so this was back in 2006 for JMS, 
in those days, the, the, the amount of data that you saw with qualitative papers was, was pretty small corpus or data set. So, you know, someone could have done 20 interviews and done a thematic or interpretive analysis. And, and what we've seen recently, particularly with top journals, is this real drive towards more data uh, and more grounded theory that really uh, lays bare the evidence upon which you make your uh, inferences and your claims. I think I'm not necessarily against more data, um, but I, I do think there's something to be said for, uh, and this is then the interpretive, more contextual approach, um, that sometimes with a small data set, there's still a lot to be done. There's still a lot to be said and, and interpreted and, and made use of. So it's not necessarily that more is always better in that sense. Sorry for the interruption, but uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Job. Thank you very much, Ibrat, for uh, letting me ask this bonus question. Uh, I think that was really relevant, for, at least for the audience at the YouTube. Uh, 